On today's Monday Night Travel, we welcome back Robin Stencil, our tour program manager, as she takes us across Europe with stories and videos from her recent trip abroad. Among other stunning sights, we'll explore the sheer cliffs and misty stone circles of England's rugged southwest, learn about tea culture at the Old Bridge in Mostar, Bosnia, and finish up with a victory lap around an Olympic track in Athens, Greece. Thanks for joining us. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Julianne Worden, and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along across Europe with my colleague and special guest, Robin Stencil. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, Robin Stencil. Hi, Robin. Hi, Julianne. It's good to be back on Monday Night Travel. It's great to have you back. We love having you on the show. And Robin, before we get started, could you just give us a little intro to what you do at Rick Steves Europe? Sure. So in a nutshell, I kind of just oversee the health and wellness of our tour program, making sure that everything is running smoothly and everyone's happy with what we're doing. And on the side, I update our guidebooks. Okay, cool. Well, I want to hear about your trip report. So I'm going to just let you run with it. And here's Robin giving her trip report. Right on. Well, first of all, I've got my Tinto de Verano ready. I've, I've, um, in honor of the summer that I spent in Europe, seven weeks crossing a lot of, uh, of area and countries, and we have a lot to cover. So I'm excited to share with you everything that I did while I was over in Europe, starting with um, two new countries for me. You actually started with Sweden and Finland, two places that I'd never been to before. And what do you do when you go to a new country that's not covered by the Rick Steves guidebook? Where we were in fin Finland and Sweden were not covered by the guidebook. So we Googled what is there to do. And the first thing that we found was what was supposed to be Sweden's ugliest church. And really, I beg to differ. We went there because we were out of curiosity. We had to go there, but it was actually really beautiful. We also discovered that we were only um, 50 miles south of the Arctic Circle. So uh, just for something fun, we decided to go up there to a town called Rovaniemi, the capital of Lapland in fin Finland, and also home to Santa's workshop, 365 days of Christmas. Um, but it was a lot of fun just to go up there and have that moment above the Arctic Circle. And then um, people were asking me, when they found out I was going to Finland, you know, are you going to see uh, the northern lights? And we were there during the summer solstice where it was 24 hours of daylight. So we decided instead of the land of the midnight sun, it was going to be the land of the midnight run. And I actually laced up my tennis shoes and went for a run right at midnight. But it wasn't very much, uh, very much time to spend there for fun. It was off to England pretty quickly after that. And I started my guidebook research, which was covering all of Southwest England, basically. So Cornwall and Dartmoor, um, up through the Cotswolds uh, and over just all over the countryside. And for this assignment, um, there was it was kind of mixed, a lot of different things that I had to do in uh, several of the places I was asked to go and update what was already in the book and go add something that was new from the last edition. So this was an example of going to, um, in Portsmouth, going and seeing the new landing craft exhibit at the World War um, World War II Museum, which was an opportunity to walk around an actual landing craft that was on uh, in Normandy on D-Day. So I got to add that coverage to the book, which was really cool. As a guidebook researcher, a lot of times it's um, a kind of a delicate balance of making sure that everything that we already cover in the book is accurate and up to date, and also knowing what else is out there that might that other travelers might be seeing. When I was in the Cotswolds, I kept seeing the um, this gin everywhere, the Cotswolds gin everywhere. And I thought, well, I need to know what that is because as a traveler, you're going to see that everywhere. And I want to know what there is available to you. So I went out to see their distillery and see the tour that they give. And it turns out you can go there and have some tastes of all of the gin and the whiskey that they make. And even if you're a driver, they actually will let you go through the whole uh, experience, the tour, and then send you home with the taste so that you don't have to worry about tasting everything and then getting back in the car on the opposite side of the road and driving back home to your hotel. So that was a fun addition as well. 
I also covered some of Wales, which is another new country for me. And I was going out to a site that we already recommend in the book. And I passed this enormous um, ironwork kind of place. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. So I went out to the site that we already recommended. And on the way back, I stopped here and I chatted with the person who worked there and it turns out that you know this place the Blenervan Ironworks wouldn't um it, it was here before the other site that we had listed in the book and actually the site that we list in the book would only be here because of this ironworks shop so it's kind of laying the foundation for that um it's really important as a researcher to stay curious and if you see something that just catches your attention it's probably going to catch the attention of other travelers and be mindful of like around the corner and through the gates you see a beautiful garden landscape like this and i want to know well, is that something that anyone can visit? And it turns out, yeah, there's actually a cafe there. You can go enjoy across from the Salisbury Cathedral. You can enjoy beautifully homemade cakes, quiches, easy breakfast with a beautiful setting. So that was something that wasn't in our book, but I kind of had, had caught it out of uh, the corner of my eye, took a chance, went in and saw what it was all about. Same thing happened in Bath. This restaurant wasn't even open when I was updating things in Bath. I walked by and my spidey sense just told me this is probably the kind of restaurant that we want to tell our readers about. And I went back while they were open and it was a Sunday. And in England, it's really popular to do a Sunday roast. And so it was in the middle of their Sunday roast rush. And I went in and I kind of observed just the way that the hostess and the servers were inter interacting with the guests like, oh, it's good to see you back again. The owner actually came out and sat down with me and gave me uh, five minutes of his time on the busiest time of the day of the week for them. Um, so I was able to get all the information that I needed to write up something really nicely about this place, which you can go check out the next time you're in Bath. Um, there's just so many wow moments when I'm when I'm researching. This was another wow moment for me. This is one of the main wow moments, I think, of my, my trip. I have maybe top three or top five to talk about tonight. Um, in the Cotswolds, uh, there was a, a standing stone circle, which is really cool. We have Avebury, of course, you have Stonehenge, we've got Dartmoor, and now... Um, I went up to check this one out in the Cotswolds, and when I got there, I saw a family playing cricket, which was a nice surprise, and it's really cool because then you see the cricket right alongside with the standing circle, and it's just such an amazing, like, ancient mix with present day. Being in this part of England required a lot of driving and a lot of countryside. And we have a driving tour that goes through Dartmoor and it checks out all of the different um, locations that, that are included in the drive. And people would think or say like, well, why do you need to go to Hound Tour to see like, isn't the formation still there? It's not like anything has changed. It's been there for centuries. It's not like it's going to be gone now. Um, but it's really important for researchers to get in the car, to actually do the driving, to see what might be new. And in this case, pretty much everywhere that we tell you to go on the driving tour, now you have to pay for parking, but only about half of the machines accept credit cards. So you need to know to have change on hand. And a lot of times it was like a two pound minimum, but coins only. So this is the kind of thing like as a researcher, we get like, oh no, I, I don't have any coins on me. So we kind of cheat a little bit and I didn't pay for parking in some of the places, but only because I couldn't pay. Um, but now, you know, for the book, you know that you have to pay there. And the other thing about checking out all of these places on a driving tour or a walking tour or seeing the cities is it allows us to kind of compare and contrast so that we can recommend to you, okay, if you only have this much time or if you're worried about kind of mobility and here's an easier one to drive to, this one's better to get out and walk to. Um, I was in Dartmoor, like I mentioned, and I was going out to see the stone circle there. It's Squirrel Stone Circle. And we had recommended in the book, oh, yeah, just, you know, get out of your car and walk through the moor. And then it's over this ridge and down this hill. And it seems very straightforward. I mean, we're in Edmonds and it's not that hard to go down the hill to the water. And, you know, then you turn around, you go back uphill to wherever you're back to the office or back to where you were going. But in Dartmoor, especially on the moors, you have to be really careful to turn around and see like every, you know, a couple minutes, turn around and pick out a landmark. Okay, yeah, I recognize that lump of, of dirt or I recognize that little grouping of rocks. 
um, because it could be really easy to get turned around. But once you're down there, it's just absolutely spectacular to have this standing circle all to yourself, not completely all to myself. There was another couple there, but it was a beautiful day on the moor. I got really lucky with the weather everywhere that I was. And it's such an amazing experience to just be in the middle and enjoy and walk around and have that moment almost all to yourself was spectacular. I had a lot of moments like that on this, on this trip. Comparing and contrasting different places is really important to us. We want to make sure that we're giving you the best tips and tricks to enjoy your time. This is a perfect example. This was in um, Cornwall. This is actually a photo of Cape Cornwall. And I love it. You even capture the artist painting the majestic seascape. Um, this is in contrast to what you'll see in a minute is Land's End. And Land's End is a very popular place, and it's a superlative of, you know, this is the land, the end of the land. Um, and Cape Cornwall is just, you know, 15 minutes down the road, and you will see just the difference between what we, we're honest about what Cape Cornwall is. It's the place to go if you just want to enjoy it on your own, not be overwhelmed with the tourist crowds. And it still serves that same purpose of imagining being on the end of the land and being a sailor and going out to sea. And the last piece of land that you see from your home country is this. And then returning home and the first view of, of land is this. It's the same experience um, in a more accessible way than as you can see here, we're now looking at what Land's End is, which has turned into basically just a touristy destination um, that just wants to take your money for everything. And, you know, it's a little bit, it's just a different experience. And I say that having been to the Arctic Circle, where it was also very touristy, I really rather much enjoyed where we were after the Arctic Circle. And now I know better. And now that's the thing about researching. Now you know better too, between Cape Cornwall and between Land's End. Uh, a big key to my success as a research, researcher is staying curious. So we tell you to go uh, on this drive and we say that you might see some ponies, but that wasn't enough for me. I actually, when I saw the ponies, I thought this is my chance. I'm going to get out of my car. And it wasn't like I was trespassing or going um, over a fence or anything. It's all public land. So I decided I was going to get up and close with the ponies and it was a spectacular experience. Um, I love to have fun when I travel. And one of the ways that I have fun is connecting with locals and being humble as a researcher can really get you set in the right direction for that. I was updating uh, Blenheim Palace and I went into the tour to the information desk and I completely overwhelmed the first person that I spoke to. I just had too many questions and she was just like, oh, let me get Sam. So she went and got Sam, this young gentleman um, who just so patiently and kindly answered all of my questions. And he was even giving me additional information that I wasn't even asking about. Uh, and it was so wonderful. And because he came in after the first person, at the end, when I was done asking all my questions, he said, now, what was this for? And I showed him the cover of the book and he got this bright smile and he said, no way. I studied your guidebooks to help me pass my A-levels. And that's an exam that they take in England. And he said, I learned so much about my own country's history from the guidebook. So that just, especially as a researcher, when you're on, on your own and on the road so long, this kind of connection is just what makes makes a trip for me. So shout out to Sam, my buddy at Blenheim Palace. Um, <laughs> everywhere I go in England, I introduce myself by saying, hi, I'm Robin. I work for Rick Steves, not Rick Stein. And I show them the book. And this is because there is a famous uh chef celebrity, a famous celebrity chef. His name is Rick Stein, and he is actually from the Penwith Peninsula. And everywhere I go, if I say Rick Steves, people automatically think Rick Stein. So that's why I have to say it. But you you can see I was in his home, on his home turf. And even the font is the same. That's the Rick Stein champagne. And now I can see no wonder people are always confused when I say Rick Steves. No, not, not Rick Stein, Rick Steves. So again, just kind of proactively being curious and, and um, having fun. I was in the Cotswolds on Borton on the Water, which is kind of an overly touristy place. And I went to the uh, Miniature World Museum and I just had this moment of like, 
just excitement and fun that I didn't plan, but I got there and I thought, this is so funny. Am I a giant or is the town li li Lilliputian? Um, so just finding those moments uh, anywhere you can get them where you can just kind of connect with the moment, be in the moment and enjoy the place and the time and the people that you're with. And speaking of people that I was with, uh, after England, I took off to Bosnia. Um, uh, there is a dear good friend of mine, Sonal. He lives just outside of Mostar. And for as long as I've known him, he's been inviting me to come stay in his hometown, Stolots. And we found that we we had three days off at the same time. So I decided to go meet him and we did some work because <laughs> we neither of us can sit still. So we did some work together. Um, first of all, we went to Mostar to check some hotels out. And then we decided to uh, give a little lesson about um, fine cuisine and coffee in Bosnia. And I'd like to share those videos with you now. Hi everyone, it's Robin from Rick Steves. I'm in Mostar in the old part of town. In fact, in front of the old bridge, which was built in the 1500s. And we're here having a lovely traditional meal. And I've decided to start with a very common topa, which is a melted cheese here, similar to fondue. It's a very traditional starter here. And instead of using a fondue fork, we use our fingers. Dobra. See you later. And um, that's another thing that I always like to do when I'm in a new country is learn a couple words that can be polite. So do dobra was the word that I was using there, and that is good or yummy, especially when talking about food. But then we moved on to, to coffee because no meal can be complete without having coffee in Bosnia. Hi, everyone. It's Robin from Rick Steve's. I'm here in Mostar, Bosnia, in fact, right in front of the old bridge with my good friend Sonal. And we've just had a lovely lunch and we've ordered Bosnian coffee to finish our meal. So tell me about Bosnian coffee. So a lot of times people are going to say, you know, Turkish coffee originally, you know, comes from there because we have been under the Ottoman Empire for quite some time. But I think after 500 years, we get to call them. You can them, claim it yourself. Yeah. Our, our own. So it actually comes in these copper settings with this little pot, which we call jesva. And you never serve it when you're like with one filter, and it always has to be two because nobody should drink coffee alone. But since it's two of us, we got one each because we are sharing together. And then you take a little spoon because there's a little foam on top. So basically, this is a grain coffee that you make and then put it in this pot over a hot stove and pour boiling water over it. And then it kind of a rises up, you know, mix it all together and you have to leave it, leave it to sit for just a little bit because you're going to see a little bit of grain. There's no filters in it. And for somebody, they always give you a little sugar. So there's a lot of ways how you can do it. My grandma, you know, will take a little piece, put it on the tongue, and then pour coffee over it. Or you can simply put it inside the fill jug, pour coffee <laughs> over it, stir a little bit, you know, for it to settle. And basically you have served yourself a Bosnian coffee and we can spend hours sitting and chatting with our friends over a piece of, you know, Bosnian coffee. And they're always going to serve you what you can recognize as Turkish delight. Mm -hmm. We call it Rahat Lokum here. Rahat Lokum. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think we could spend hours in this lovely setting having our Bosnian coffee. Agreed. See you later. Yeah, so um, that is true. You could maybe hear the misters going off. It was really hot, but Everyone in Bosnia takes the time out from whatever they're doing to have their coffee. And in fact, um, Sonal, when I got my house, he bought me a housewarming gift and he bought me my own. And like he said, you always have to have two cups because you never drink coffee alone, never drink Bosnian coffee alone. So then the next day we set off, um, actually we crossed the border over in Tro into Croatia. We had some work to do on the Pelashots Peninsula. And on the way, there's so much history that happened in that region in Yugos ex Yugoslavia, especially the border between Croatia 
and Bosnia. And it's been a long time coming for this bridge that you can see behind me to be built. And it, it's brand new. Well, it's almost brand new, um, but very significant for connecting the Croatian mainland or the kind of the northern part of the country with the southern tip of the country of Croatia, because it used to be that you would have to go through Bosnia to just to access it. And it, that required two different border crossings. Um, but now they have this new bridge built and we wanted to share a little bit about what that means. Hi everyone, it's Robin from Rick Steves. I'm in Croatia and I'm standing in front of a brand new bridge. Actually, it's the one year anniversary of this bridge and the significance of it is it connected the southern portion of Croatia to the rest of the country. Something really unique here is that before this bridge was built, you actually had to leave Croatia, cross the border into Bosnia, and then cross back out of Bosnia, back into Croatia in order to reach the southern part of the country. And that's because Bosnia had managed to secure 24 kilometers of beach. And that's a very important thing that Bosnian people are really proud of. But now, thanks to a $2 billion project, Croatians and vacationers alike can cut straight across and connect the Pelishots Peninsula with the rest of the country with this new bridge. And thanks to the construction of the bridge, it opened up new opportunities like creating a brand new beach directly beneath us. See you next time. Yeah, so the Bosnians are really proud of the, the tiny stretch of beach that they had. So we crossed over to the Pelishots Peninsula in Croatia, and they are known for the, this is where they grow their wine. This is a wine growing region, uh, and it's famous for Plavic Mali, and that is the red grape that they grow here. Um, there's a, a one famous producer of Plavik Mali, and it's called the Grigic Winery. And he is actually responsible for taking Plavitz Mali to Napa Valley, and it became Zinfandel. So we decided that we were going to um, pay a visit to his winery and go check out the Poship and Plavitz Mali wine that they make there. But really, it was just a sidetrack, because our ultimate destination was something that Sonal has been telling about me for years, promising to take me to for years. This is a local farm in Croatia that raises donkeys, among other things. It's called the Antunovic farm, and it's run by the family Antunovic. And here we got to experience all of the donkeys. And I was so thrilled, again, finding that moment of just having fun. And it was all that Sonal could do to keep me from jumping Everyone, down. Everyone, Robin from Rick Steves. I'm in Croatia at the Antonovic farm, which as you might see, raises donkeys. They have about 80 donkeys on the property. And there's one Papa donkey that's in charge of making all of the mama donkeys mamas. And you might also notice there's two different color donkeys. The darker donkeys are from the Istria region of Croatia and the paler donkeys are from Dalmatia. They raise these donkeys here for the milk, which is the only milk you can drink without it being pasteurized. So they produce the milk and then they sell it on their farm. We're gonna go have a little tasting ourselves later and let you know how it goes. See you later. Yeah, so it was really fun to go get to see the donkeys. And then we went up to the farmhouse where um, they serve meals and we got to, um, talk with some of the family members and see what they do. I didn't know Sana was taking this video of me. I was just really excited to be petting the donkeys. And we do take our um, we're, we take our tour groups here on the Best of the Adriatic Tour. Uh, it, it's something that anyone can go do and visit on on your own as well, though. And it's really this particular part of Croatia. There is a lot of farms like this where you can go have local locally made produce. Hi everyone, it's Robin from Rick Steves. I'm in Croatia at the Antonovic farm and we just saw some donkeys outside. This is where we come to have a traditional lunch, including the very popular under the bell traditional Croatian meal. And in just a minute, we're going to get to try some donkey milk. See you later. As you can tell, I was very excited about trying the donkey milk. 
Hi everyone, it's Robin from Rick Steves. I'm in Croatia at the Antonovic family farm where they raise donkeys and produce so many delicious delicacies that are typical of the region. And we have with us a member of the family to talk a little bit about what the farm produces. So, give us a little bit of information. I'm Yasmina, I'm one of the family members. Uh, we are farmers, we produce food. This is the most important thing that we serve from farm to the table. Uh, we have our sheep, goats, cows, pigs, chickens, and donkeys. Uh, and we uh, produce our vegetables, the potatoes, tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, salad, uh, all the seasonal uh, vegetables for us, for our family, and our guests. And all of those go together into the very most traditional meal, right? Yes. Um, our pekka, the guests uh, really like it. And one of the reasons is uh, because we have uh, the domestic vegetables inside. Because of that, they are juicy and tasty. Without any spices, only vegetables and salt. Only the natural flavors of the food. Yes. And all of that goes into a pan, on top of the fire, and under what we call the bell, right? The bell, yes. <coughs> The bell for three, three and a half hours. And then it comes out as a delicious meal for everyone to try. Yes, tender and tasty. Wonderful. Well, thank you for explaining a little bit about the farm and what you do here, the products that you have, which look and smell and taste amazing. Thank you very much. See you next time. See you. I highly recommend trying Under the Bell if you're in Croatia and have the chance to try that. And then, of course, finally, we get to taste the donkey milk. Hi everyone, it's Robin from Rick Steves. I'm in Croatia at the Antonovic farm where they raise donkeys. And thanks to their generous hospitality, we even get to have a little taste. Oh, yeah, it's really sweet. Yeah, it's so good. I was really shocked at how sweet it was, but more than that, when can you ever say that you drank donkey milk straight from the donkey farm? I remember going to Tillamook and having the fresh milk and cheese and Tillamook, but this one steps it up a notch. Then I had one more evening with Sonal and we were just kind of wrapping up, talking about what's new and um, having a good time Everyone sharing, Robin from sharing a new I'm experience Stowell, with a friend. Bosnia, my friend Sonal's hometown. And we're just here having a nice conversation before dinner. We decided to order a couple drinks. I got a pretty boring drink, just some mineral <laughs> sparkling water, but Sonal, what did you get? Well, I, without thinking, I ordered cocktails, you know, Cocta. it is a drink when you think about it, it was made in Yugoslavia in attempt to cope a Coke, a Coke, yeah, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Yeah. Because we didn't have that, uh, think about like 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, the time of the Cold War and everything was happening and we were kind of a stuck in between the East and the West, you know, we were open, but still a lot of like particular Americans. When they speak about us, they put us in this, you know, Eastern Europe yes. moment and they think we were behind the Iron Curtain, but we're not. So we had a lot of things, but we didn't have Coke, Coca-Cola. So what they did, they started to producing what they sold us as our Coke. Your version of Coca-Cola. Our version of Coca-Cola. And this is it. This is Coke and still very popular now after Yugoslavia kind of a... Uh, separating all these republics ended up being produced in Slovenia, but still, hey, you install us and having a Coke, and what do we say? Jubilee. And let's be clear, you can actually still get Coca-Cola here now. I've of had course. my fair share of Coke Zeros on this trip. But, without even thinking, you went for the Coke Yeah. That's very... Telling, <laughs> it's right? very local. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you said something interesting just now. Eastern Europe. And I'm really excited that at Rick Steves, we've actually changed the name of our tour from Eastern Europe to Central Europe. To finally what it should be. What does that mean to you? So it means that, you know, we're trying to get what, how we feel about it. Like when you ask the local people, we will never say we live in Eastern Europe. And geographically, when you look at it, we literally live in the Central Europe. But we kind of went along with this story because it was much easier when you have uh, a group of people coming from North America to, you know, say, yeah, you know, this is what you consider to be Eastern Europe, but for us it's not. We yes. consider this to be part of the Central Europe. You make a good point about that, about geographically speaking, 
Bosnia, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Croatia yeah. they're not on the eastern part of Europe. They're part of Central Europe. Central Europe yeah. So this is why we're really excited that going forward, the guidebook will be called Best of Central Europe. And the tour will be called again Best of Central Europe. I'm glad that we're finally teaching Americans the proper name, and we are cutting down those misconceptions that East is associated with yeah, Russia, Russia and, with Iron Curtain, yeah. with all of that. Because as you can see, and as I hope that we've been showing, it's not. No. It's so colorful and so open and so full of friendly faces. And Sonal is one of my dear good friends here, so I'm glad I've got to spend the last couple of days with him. And we'll have more to teach you, I'm Thanks sure. So much. See you later. This is a really pivotal you, turning you point for us that we have changed the name of the book to Central Europe and we've changed the name of the tour to Central Europe. I believe that Rick has written about it. Cameron Hewitt has probably already also written about it. I think I've seen him write about it. Um, so we're really uh, excited to be ahead of the curve on that and hopefully it'll catch on throughout throughout America. Uh, but then my time with Sonal ended and I was on to the next thing. From the time that I got this assignment, I knew that my oldest best friend and her family were going to be in Europe at the same time that I was. So I said, all right, we're keeping one weekend to ourselves and you pick the place and we're going to go have a weekend together at the end of my trip. And so we chose Athens and I always forget how windy it is up at the Acropolis. Also very, very crowded and quite hot. Um, we were there with her family and traveling with families is always a little bit different. Uh, it's hard to find family rooms at hotels sometimes. So we decided early on that instead of staying at a hotel, we were gonna stay at an apartment, which just made it so much easier for us. Um, this was at the little neighborhood square that's just, it's, it's right outside of downtown Athens, in its own kind of suburb neighborhood, ringed by a couple of restaurants and a pharmacy and a park. Um, so we met up in Athens and then we decided we were gonna go explore. And like I said, very crowded in the Acropolis, very hot. And I thought, I just wish that I could be back in England <laughs> on Dover Hill where there was nobody around and I'm just gonna conjure up this image right now. But instead, unfortunately, I was stuck on top of the Acropolis with all of the uh, cruise ship day trippers. It was so hot in Athens, you were actually closing down monuments in the middle of the day. So what was happening is that all of those cruise ship day trippers that were trying to go, they didn't get to go and they all came in the morning. Uh, but that was okay with us, just some more pastoral images for us to all calm down with. We really just decided that we were going to try to just do one thing each day, the, the thing that was most important to us, and not worry about anything else. Um, also traveling with kids, it's really important to not worry about if you're gonna be at the finest restaurant or if you're gonna do the very best things. It's just about, we're tired, we're hungry, we need somewhere to eat, where can we get in? Where is it gonna be cool? And that's really how you can maximize your time as a family traveling in Europe. Uh, it's not so much about everything that you check off your list. It's about being with people. And I, I was joking, I think I spent more time with her in Athens than we spend when we're here in America. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to share my favorite things with the kids. Um, and like I said, having the apartment was just spectacular because we had a communal place to be. We could have an easy night in, get up early the next day, hit the road. Um, and the by far, like the most thing that we wanted to do of all was go to the uh, Olympic Stadium in Athens. We're all crazy athlete nuts. Um, and my godson, Bryce, he said, I want to run a lap in the uh, Olympic Stadium. And mind you, <laughs> it was over 100 degrees outside. It was three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so, you know, it was after a day already of sightseeing, very hot. Um, but, you know, this is what you come to Europe for. This is what you come to experience. And this is something that will live on for him and for his family and for us that we got to see him do this really special thing. And I, I say right now, when he becomes a famous superstar athlete, I'm going to have this video of him running a lap in Athens at the Olympic Stadium that he can remember this moment with. Um, 
he also he also even though he gets a little tired he completed this lap i think faster than i could possibly run a lap um and that's saying something so it was just a really fun time for us to get together and um slow down and just kind of enjoy the moment have this time with one another um it was different for me because i'm so go 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 everywhere on assignment that um, just having one thing a day to do and doing it fully and enjoying it uh, really set a different tone and set a different pace. And this is definitely one of those top three wow moments of, of my summer. I definitely think this might even be the number one wow moment of my summer. And it's something that I will remember forever. And I hope that you Yay, guys Bryce. too. Um, so that was a lot of fun just to get to spend that time with them. And then I was home to see my dog and to get my Rick Steves playlist, um, the the music playlist to keep me going when I'm on the road and I need some something in the background while I'm working. Um, I was home for a little bit and then I was back on the road to Spain and I was in Andalusia in southern Spain in August over Assumption Weekend, which is a holiday there. And if you have ever been in Spain during a holiday, you can understand uh, this scene, 10 o'clock in the morning. And of course, why wouldn't you be having beers? This assignment was different though, because I was actually following Rick. Rick had already done the research in Andalusia for the book. And I kind of came in to sweep up after him to make sure that everything was working okay, that nothing was missed. And it was a really neat assignment for me because uh, on our tours that go to Spain, we every time that I've been there, it's always seen the same two sites in every city. But doing the research, you really got to see some of the um, the secondary museums and sites that are just as spectacular and not nearly as crowded. This is the La Brea House in Sevilla. Um, beautiful tile work and almost completely empty compared to the Alcazar or the Alhambra where you're going to run into a lot of crowds. Of course, you have to see those things if you're there for the first time, but it was also amazing to pop into these Arab baths in Granada that I had never seen before. That are, I've probably walked past them 25 times. Every time I've been in Granada, I've probably walked past them, uh, but for the first time, got to jump in and see. Rick did a lot of work on the restaurants in Andalusia. And he basically said to me, like, just make sure it all works. So this was my attempt in Sevilla going to all of the tapas bars in one night to see, to make sure that they all work. And thank goodness that I can pretty much live off of Spanish cheese and jamon and wine because it was a big duty to go and make sure that they all were worthy of what he had written and what he had added. It was really cool though, because I had a couple places in mind that I would maybe go add myself and he had already added them. Uh, also seeing some of the places that off of the beaten track places, uh, the hill towns in Andalusia that we don't always get to, it was really neat to go there on purpose as a researcher. And Grazalema and Zahara, they're beautiful places just as worthy as visiting as Arcos or Ronda. Um, and you, you get there... Uh, during a time of a fiesta and you can see how colorful it is and this <laughs> there's no one on the street because they had been out partying all night so they, i caught them when everyone was having a siesta but beautiful time to be there and to enjoy all of the culture now my final probably final wow moment uh the, of the top three was going to the pilata caves um, and this is a prehistoric cave and you have to make advanced reservations, but they don't have a website. You have to do it by phone. But don't worry if you're nervous about that, your hotel can help you um, call them and get the reservation. And you would think, well, why can't they like get with the times and get a website? Well, I didn't know I'd never been there before. But you actually go to the cave and you walk up there and all it is is a little hut, a little kiosk right at the entrance to the cave. And I asked them, like, are you ever going to have a website? Are you going to get reservations online? And the guy looked at me and he was like, we don't have reception up here. So literally the people sit there all day at the cave to answer the phone to take a reservation. But this cave was absolutely amazing. Prehistor it was prehistoric art. Um, you get to see, this is the only place you could take a photo. You see more art than just this. I'm going to pause here because I want to talk more about this cave. It was spectacular. Um, so a local farmer, he kept seeing bats fly in and out of this hole near his, his farm. And at the time, um, bat guano was really like a commodity. He knew you could make a lot of money if he went and uh, harvested the bat guano. So one night he went up there 
he went into the cave where they were all flying out of and to his surprise he found something way more valuable than bat guano um so of course it was preserved and now you can go there with a guided tour and you get a tour like a little lamp lantern to carry with you so you don't have to worry about it being dark but it in one of the most spectacular things that i've ever witnessed you know stalactites and stalagmites well stalactites are hollow and if you knock against the stalactite, it'll make a noise. It'll make like a sound, an echo. And scientists have actually um, found fragments of bone in the stalactites where they have kind of hypothesized that there was some kind of um, rhythm or like what they were, what they are kind of calling like the first music concert ever um, because they thought that they were smacking the bones against these stalactites to beat a rhythm to play music for the people who were painting these paintings. It was so spectacular. And then to cap it all off in the largest room in the largest hall, the guide said, okay, now we're all gonna turn off our lamps for 10 seconds. I'll count out loud but no one speak, no one do anything for 10 seconds. And so we all turned off our lanterns. It was the pitchest black. I knew it would be dark, of course, but it was the pitchest black you cannot imagine. And thank God he counted out loud because I could feel people around me getting nervous, like, okay, turn the lights back on. So honestly, if you're going to be anywhere near that area, near Rhonda, please consider going to the Pilata Caves and seeing this historic ancient prehistoric site. But back to civilization, um, what do you do in Andalusia? You see flamenco. And I think there was a stretch where I saw a different flamenco performance five nights in a row. But again, it's, you know, is it, a, a, do you want to have dinner in flamenco? Do you want to have a more intimate performance? What kind of show do you want? So this is why we list the different venues and experiences and uh, Casa de la Memoria is a highlight of going and seeing flamenco in Sevilla, very intimate, um, really high class performers there, but there is flamenco for any style, any budget in basically, and you can go in Sevilla, you can go in Ronda, you can go in Cordoba, you've got plenty of options there. So um, after that, I moved on to Arcos, our lovely hill town, and um, met Jose, who works with um, local reeds to weave things. And I was talking to him about like what he does and how he does it. So that's a little bonus for the walking tour in Arcos for the next time that you're there. You can say hi to Jose. Rick really just wants you to live the book, and that is just going okay, if this were my first time traveling, I've got the book in my hand, what am I going to do when I get to Rhonda? So really, that was my approach to just kind of, all right, this is just pretend I've never been here before and go make sure that it all works out. Um, make sure that if we say to go up to the Alhambra in the evening, make sure that our walking tour doesn't doesn't start at the top of the Albay scene and go back down into town, but it should start down in town and up and up, end up at the San Nicolas viewpoint on the Albi scene at, at night, like at sunset. So really kind of taking a step back, getting a higher view of the content in the book and making sure that it all makes sense for the best experience. In Cordoba, they have a wine and they can't call it sherry because it's not actually from Jerez. So they have to call it Montilla Marilis, but it uses the same grape, Pedro Jimenez. And Rick really wanted to up our game in that area. So I got to put my wine knowledge to, to the test uh, and use some of that to get ready to uh, introduce Montilla Marilis and Jerez. I went to Jerez to update the book and we really focus a lot on the bodegas experience in Jerez where you can go have a proper tasting. What I did, um, knowing I was going to go to Jerez, is I took time to kind of research and update, okay, what else can you do when you're at Jerez? And added some information about the Tabanco culture there, which were originally places you could go fill up your big, your own jug of sherry and take it home with you. And they've kind of... Um, They've maintained this kind of ambiance and atmosphere, but there's a whole route of tabancos in Jerez that you can go nibble your way through. And some of them even have free flamenco. And then again, it was just um, utilizing what I know um, from my wine in information and from loving Spanish cuisine to say, like, if you're at this particular bar, 
you got to try the payo payoyo cheese, not just any manchego cheese. You got to try the payoyo cheese when you're at this restaurant because the payoyo cheese is the local cheese. You got to have the jamon ibirico because that's the best jamon. And then don't try to do your own wine choosing. Just ask the, the guy to help you select the best wine that pairs with those things. Um, so just adding those little details to the to the book to help you all have a better experience in your travels. Uh, and then it was, that was basically it. Then I was on, um, then it was time for me to work in the files with my own Tinto di Verano and just add everything to the book so that you guys can have a beautiful experience the next time that you're traveling through Spain or England or Bosnia or <laughs> Finland or Sweden. Well, Robin, that was awesome. I have so many questions and just there were so many amazing experiences throughout the whole trip from the caves to Sam at Blenheim Palace. <laughs> I just want to get back out there now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was incredible. Like I just, that was, I mean, it's just for me, the fun of traveling. I mean, this was a hard assignment, right? It's not easy. You're, you're a lot of one night stops. You're going from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. And in the heat, I think I ended up calculating that I walked 110 miles in Spain in, in like eight days. And in all of those days were over a hundred degrees. So there is nothing, you know, it's a great job. It's a great job. It's challenging and it's fun. Um, but it really is enhanced by having those connections with like Sam and having, you know, friends to show you around and also just kind of like doing what the locals do. And if it's 10 o'clock on a Monday and it's a holiday, just go ahead and have that beer. <laughs> Well, if you're walking in all that heat, I think you deserve that beer too. <laughs> Need some hydration. And Robin, we have a lot of great questions tonight, but before we get to those, I'll just give a quick word from our sponsor. And the word from our sponsor tonight is we're just kind of doing a reflection on travel at Rick Steves Europe as our theme for October. And so if you want, you can send two to three photos of a trip you took in 2023 to share at ricksteves.com for a chance to be featured on our social media page. You could see on Facebook or Instagram, Robin's been featured on there with some of her stories. And we've had a couple other uh, people featured as well. So it's pretty cool. Also today, my coworker Zen, who is also the, does the intro voice in our new introduction here. Zen pointed out that today is Indigenous Peoples Day. And it's just a nice thing to acknowledge. And I was thinking Robin went around and learned the history of the land in Europe. Indigenous Peoples Day is a reminder to learn the history of the land here at home too. Okay, Robin, now time to get into our questions. The first one is from Carol, and you were talking about the England and all the beautiful gardens that they have there. If you could pick two favorite gardens across all of Europe, <laughs> it's kind of broad, oh. what could be two of your favorites? Just the first one's coming All of Europe? Oh, man. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> uh, well, I saw a lot of gardens in England this summer, and um, gosh, one of the name of it, they all run together. It, it escapes me right now. I'm sorry. But um, England definitely has a fair share of beautiful gardens. There are a couple in Rome that I like that are sort of hidden. Um, but I think that if you're interested in particular gardens, the best thing you can do is, is Google them. There are a lot of uh, organizations out there that just do like garden trips or whotnot. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes just being out in the Cotswolds and walking through the, the paths, walking along the ways, like you'll, you'll see like backyard gardens or kind of like churchyard gardens. Um, I don't know that I have had like a particular experience in an organized garden that stands out more than another. Yeah, I love that too. Even the stone circles you've been around. I mean, I don't know if you'd consider a garden, but that just reminds me with the paths of just being out in nature. Yeah. <laughs> Our next question is from Olivia. And of course you went far from west to east on this trip. Did you rent a car? How is it with public transportation in these countries or driving? Yeah, I rented, I had, I rented a car in England. Um, public transportation can get you so far and it's pretty, I mean, it'll connect you to the big cities, um, but having a car really allows you to kind of, like, I'm so curious, I will drive past something and be like, oh, I want to go over there. So that's where like public transportation or even kind of group tours don't work as well because you have to just go along with um, whatever is on the program or where the next stop is. So um, what I always say about driving in England is like, you can do it. Everyone has driven uh, in, in the left lane of a freeway. So like, you know, you can do it. And one little 
trick that I always do when I'm in England. It seems silly. It just really enforces it for me though. Every time I'm about to get in the car, I stop and I say, I'm in England. <laughs> and in England, we drive on the left side of the road. And every time I come to a roundabout or an intersection, I also remind myself that. And it just kind of cements it in. Um, it you It's a little nerve wracking at first, um, but you can, like anyone can do it and just go slow. It's okay to let people go around you, stay in the right lane, let people pass you. Um, yeah, definitely. But having a car just provides so much freedom if you can get over the, the nerve of it. Yes. Yeah. And you visited some off the beaten track sites, like you were able to reach with the car. We also visited some more popular places like, um, the Acropolis in Athens. How many sites did you have to book in advance? Um, a lot of them. So, uh, the, in Sevilla, definitely the Alcazar and in Granada, the Alhambra, um, the Palata Cave, that was necessary to, to do in advance. Um, in England, it wasn't so much because there's just so much nature. In England, there aren't so many like top sites that you have to book in advance. The We did do the Acropolis in advance, I believe, or else we got, um, we bought our tickets. That's what we did. We bought our tickets from the machine or online and it wasn't a specific entry but allowed you to skip the line so a lot of times even if you're not booking like a, a time window if you buy online first um you can skip the line but definitely in Sevilla and the Alcazar it's mandatory now and, it, and that has changed it wasn't so long ago that it was easy just to show up at the Alcazar and go in but now you really have to go get your ticket and you have to know that you need to get your ticket in advance because <laughs> otherwise you'll just line up and all those people have tickets and so you, you, you're going to waste an hour waiting in line and get to the front and they're going to be like, where's your ticket? And you're like, I don't have a ticket. <laughs> then they send you around the corner, like a kid getting put in the corner of class. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really important now, but our book will definitely tell you where and when it's, it's necessary to get a reservation in advance where it's nice to get a reservation in advance. So we definitely distinguish that for them. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Where can you learn where you need a book in advance? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the Palata Caves as one of your top things and that you have to book in advance for the Palata Cave. It's so interesting that you mentioned knocking on the Stalag Might because I was just, we have a Monday night travel guest. They're going to be on the show on October 30th. But in one of the video clips we're going to show, they mentioned the Luray Caverns. I think, mm -hmm. it, have you heard of those before? Yeah. Uh -huh. I've never heard of them, but they have a stalactite pipe organ and it's an organ made out of um, yeah. stalactites at least. Yeah. Stalactites. Uh, stalactites. Stalactites. Yeah. Because, so this is how I remember it, by the way. So stalactite has a C in the word and that's how I know they come down from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Stalactites are hollow because they've just been dripping down from the ceiling and that's why they reverberate. That's why they make sound. Interesting. Yeah. Also, also in this clip, they say, Stalag, let's see. Uh, stalactite holds tight to the ceiling and stalagmite might reach the top. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> talk a lot about caves tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's amazing. I love Did they have rules for you when you were going into the cave? Like you can't touch certain things or um, well, they're really good about like the first part, they allow photos and then they'll tell you like this is the last place you can take a photo. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's really tempting to kind of just like hang back and maybe try to take a photo. But then you have to realize like, this needs to be preserved forever. So just, you know, it's really it, be respectful and honor those rules. And, you know, sometimes the best memories aren't from photos, they're from your memory. So that's what I tried to like take away from it. Yeah, it's special going into an actual cave like at Lascaux in France, they have the replica, which is awesome to preserve it, but it's special you got to go into one. Yeah. As the tour program manager, Jesse was wondering, what would be your top Brooks Use tour to go on oh, if you haven't you guys... been on one? <laughs> oh, okay, well, this is like choosing your favorite child. It's yeah. very hard. Um, and I like to compare it to like ice cream. Like you love your favorite ice cream flavor. Um, you can try something new and it might be great. Or you try something and you're like, oh, I wish I had tried my own ice cream flavor. So I'll say that all of our tours are great. <laughs> um, but no, honestly, the ones that I've been most blown away by, the ones that I've gone into with um, like no expectations. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean like it, I happened to get to go on this tour. I hadn't planned on going on the tour. Um, the ones that have blown me away have really been um, the Eastern Europe tour, which is now the Central Europe tour. Um, that one, the Adriatic tour is amazing. I really love Greece. I, I love the the culture and the people there. So I would travel anywhere in Greece. Um, 
And yeah, if you're interested in kind of having more flexibility and freedom, I think our My Way tours are really great because you it takes care of the things that most people don't want to take care of, right? Like, I don't want to deal with reservations. I don't want to deal with driving. So we take care of that for you. And then you can kind of just do your own sightseeing. So those are, I always like to highlight those too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And kind of building off of that, this is our last question for tonight. Katie was wondering, which you kind of answered it in this last answer. So I'm curious to see if it is. Um, which culture do you feel most connected to in Europe? Um, it's the Spanish culture. Definitely. I mean, just, you know, you get that sense of feeling like I could, I could live here or maybe I have lived here in some previous life or something. It's just very comfortable for me to be there. I, I don't, I, I speak Spanish now, but I, I don't, I'm not fluent. Um, but just the way of life there, it's very, it's laid back, um, but it has everything that you need. And I love the food and I love the people are friendly, um, especially outside of the big cities. It just feels like you you can fit in, like you don't feel like an outsider. Like I've, I have felt so welcomed everywhere that I've gone in Spain. Um, it just kind of is very comfortable for me. But that said, I could also easily live in Greece or Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, Switzerland. Okay. I was thinking the warm places that with the warm embrace of the people. <laughs> the warm Switzerland, places yeah. are great. No, I mean, it, again, it's just kind of a feeling like if you, it's like looking at art, like you see a painting and you're like, oh, I really love that painting. And you have to kind of deconstruct what it is that you are, that you find attracted, attractive about that painting. But like, definitely you see one painting and you're attracted to it, see another painting and maybe it's not your cup of tea. That's how I feel like I'm in Switzerland And I just feel like I could live there forever and I feel at home and I feel very comfortable there. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, Robin, I so enjoyed hearing about your travels. I think those are hard to top all of the places you went, but maybe someone will send us something to share at (laughs) ricksteve.com with even more places. And so thank you so much, Robin, for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. And I hope to be back again sometime in the future. Great, we hope to have you back. And next week on Monday Night Travel, we are headed to France with Steve Smith, who has been on Monday Night Travel a few times before. So we hope to see you there. Good night, Robin. Good night, Ben. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us.